Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. Today's video, I want to share five ways to help glue our mixes together. Getting that coveted glue, that cohesion, that sense of all of our tracks working together in the same sonic space is something that a lot of beginner and intermediate mixers tend to struggle with. And so today I wanna to shed some light on that and offer five different strategies to help glue our mixes together. So without further ado, let's hop into Logic Pro and get started. All right, here we are inside of Logic Pro to talk about a few different strategies to glue our mixes together. Throughout this video, we will be working on one of my own tracks called Menu off of an upcoming record of mine, Fine Dining with an Octopus. Once that's out, I will leave a link to it in the description box down below. But for the time being, let's hop directly into strategy one, and that is balancing. So balancing is one of the most important aspects of mixing, and it is the first strategy I want to talk about for getting glue in the mix. So what I mean primarily by balancing, which makes up about 80% of the mix or more in my estimation, in my opinion, is the relative levels and the relative panning positions of the tracks. So if I bring up the mixer right here, you can see that we have most of the tracks panned to the center. We have a few just offside and then some hard pan to the right and to the left. So I'm using largely a left center right or LCR type panning. So that is one way of balancing the mix. And then we also have right here our relative levels by the faders right here. Now, personally, I like to gain stage the mix. And so before I get to balancing each of the tracks with faders, I will actually balance them all so that they have the same levels with all of the faders at unity gain. And so I do that by gain staging. I have a video on gain staging. I will leave a link to that in the description box down below if you're interested in checking that out. But if we want our mixes to sound cohesive and glued together, and like all of the tracks are working together properly, we need a proper balance. Tracks can't be overrepresented or underrepresented. They have to work together in a solid balanced mix. So when you're working on your own mixes, think about how all of the individual elements work together to create a cohesive sonic universe and how everything fits into that universe and then do your best to balance them accordingly. If you're struggling to really nail down the balance in your mixes, I would highly recommend utilizing reference mixes, those mixes that are in a similar style or genre to your track and listening to how those engineers balanced their tracks and trying to emulate that in your own Again, if you're having difficulty finding that proper balance. So if we listen back a little bit to this mix, what I'll do is I'll play back a few bars with the balance that I have right here, and then I'll start bringing things way too loud or way too quiet in the mix, and we can kind of listen to how the glue or the sonic universe starts to waver a little bit or even fall apart in some instances. So let's go to a heavier section right here, and I'll just loop the main part of this song like this. So it's relatively balanced. And now if I bring, say, the bass up, I'll just bring the bass up 6 dB. So it's really bottom heavy. Now if I bring down the kick and the snare, let's say. kind of loses its glue. The main parts of the percussion are kind of underestimated and the bass is way too over in the mix. If I bring this back up. More balanced, more cohesive. If I bring the guitars way too up. They just don't sound like they fit into the mix anymore. And we kind of lose that sense of glue or cohesion. If I bring the synths down. So 
So you heard there a rather obvious or rather aggressive level changing and balance changing throughout the mix, but I just really wanted to make it obvious to you that getting the proper balance really helps to tie everything together and get a sense of glue in the mix and having things that are way overrepresented or way underrepresented within that sonic universe that I continue to reference will really throw off the sense of cohesion and unity and glue within the mix. So balance is first and foremost the most important thing in my opinion for getting that sense of glue within the mix. All right, strategy number two for getting glue in our mixes is the one that everybody loves talking about, and that is bus compression. Not only on our mix bus, you can see here on the mix bus, I do have some compression right here, some bus compression. I'm using the Waves SSL comp right here, but also in our subgroups. So for example, if I scroll over here in the mixer, I have a drum subgroup right here, which has all of the individual drums being bussed to it. You can see kick in, kick, kick out, kick sub, snare top, snare bottom, snare, hi-hat, overhead, room are all being bussed to one. Bus one comes in here and I have another SSL comp from Waves right here acting on the drums right here. I also have some limiting, which is hard compression and some clipping as well, just to help tame those dynamics a little bit more. So bus compression, as the name would suggest, acts upon a bunch of different tracks being bussed together to a single point within the mixer. Again, in the case of the drum subgroup compression right here, we're acting upon all of these tracks. And then the mix bus compressor right here is acting on all of the tracks being outputted ultimately in the mix. And so because bus compressors are acting upon a bunch of different tracks being bussed together, they will act upon or be triggered by the heaviest or most present transient information, but they will act upon all of the information being sent through them. And so they will act to compress or duck the information holistically and help to tie it all together in that way, pulling down the most transient information, bringing up all of the more nuanced information and doing so in a more holistic way that helps to tie together all of the information being bussed to that specific bus or subgroup. And so bus compression in certain instances can help us to get a little bit of added groove to different transient information, particularly when we spend some time to hone in on the attack and release times here. It can help to bring up the nuance, especially in the sides information, because typically the most transient information will be in the center image, particularly when we are sending stereo information to a bus and then compressing that bus. And of course, it can give us an overall sense of glue within the mix, because again, it is acting on a bunch of different tracks being bussed to a single point rather than on an individual track and then having that individual track be mixed after the fact within the mix. So I hope that that makes sense. The key here is that the compressor is acting on a bunch of tracks together rather than on individual tracks. And when we end up processing multiple tracks in a bus situation, then we ultimately help to glue those tracks together because we're processing them all the same. So to demonstrate here, let us solo the drums and I will solo my voice as well. And what I'm going to do is actually turn off the standard clip right here and the L1 limiter. So we are only listening to the drums being processed through this drum bus compressor right here. I'll even exit out of the mix bus compressor right here. And let's have a listen to this on and off. So again, we are only listening to the drums here and of course my voice. So we can really hear what bus compression is doing on a drum subgroup. Let's whip it on. So it's only digging about 2 dB here, 2 dB of gain reduction, mostly on the kick drum, helping to tie things in. So even when those hats are going, the compressor is still being triggered by the kick drum. Now if I turn it off. Can hear each of the individual elements a little bit more clearly almost but they sound a little bit more disparate in the mix if i turn it back on they'll sound a little bit closer a little bit more tight and tied together very subtle without So there's almost more space when there's no compression going on. Back on. And even though there's maybe a bit less space when the compressor is on, 
it does help to tie things together in a little bit right here. Now let's go on to the entirety of the mix. I'll just keep this playing. We'll move to the mix bus now. And I'm only just barely touching it right here. Let's actually turn the threshold down so we're getting a little bit more just to make it a bit more obvious. Maybe maxing out at 2 dB of gain reduction. Now let's turn this off. Off. Listen to the size information, the uh, synthesizer in particular. Back on. The center almost gets glued together and then the size information can be a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more upfront in the mix. I'll turn it off again. more separation when it's off and then when it's on it just helps to not necessarily take down the separation but just to bring things almost you know glue in them together off back on and so it's subtle and it's kind of hard to explain. You can hear that I'm struggling to come up with the words for this, but it's almost as if we are taking away a little bit of transparency and a little bit of separation to help to make things sound a little bit more cohesive in the mix. Now, this may or may not be something that you want to do in the mix. We often strive to get that separation and that clarity within the mix. And so gluing things together may not be something that we necessarily want to do, but I just want to show you here that it is something that we can do to help solidify elements within the mix. I feel like I did a relatively good job in this mix getting separation and I wanted to get things a little bit more together, a little bit more cohesive within the mix. And so I decided to go with just a little bit of mix bus compression right here. And you'll notice in the demonstration that I actually brought the threshold down. And originally I had this so that I was only getting about a dB maximum of gain reduction. And so I will actually bring this back down to where it was at. So I was just barely touching it, just a little bit of that cohesion I wanted. I didn't want to go too far, but I did want to show you in a more obvious fashion. So I adjusted the mix bus compression parameters right here. All right, moving on from mix bus and bus compression, we have strategy number three, which is utilizing bus saturation. And so saturation is kind of like compression. There are slight compression characteristics in saturation, but it's primarily about harmonic generation. And so if we are to saturate an audio signal, we're basically distorting it. And as we are distorting the signal, we're adding in harmonic content based on the content that is already there. And when we bus multiple signals together and then saturate the combination of all of those signals, then we are effectively adding in harmonic content based off of all of those tracks that are being bussed together. And so in this particular mix, I'm not using a whole lot of bus saturation. However, we can go over here to see that I am using some on the percussion bus. We see we have a bus right here that is being fed by each of these. So I have samples, three hats and a China sample. Those are being bussed to bus seven. Bus seven is the input right here for this perk bus. And then I have a little bit of EQ just taking out some mid range and then I'm making up some of that with Saturn 2. This is my favorite saturation plugin. And so if we zoom in on the arrangement view right here, we see that there's not a whole lot of action going on in the percussion instruments right here. But if I just loop this short part, we can have a look and listen to what's happening here. So let's solo my voice and the percussion bus right here. And I will toggle this Saturn 2 on and off as we just have a brief listen right here, just to hear what I'm doing in the mix. And then perhaps I will put some saturation on the mix bus and have a listen on and off to that. And off. Off. 
So one, it's louder. I didn't do a great job of ABing this. And so it's giving it a little bit more grit, but we can't really hear it gluing things together because all of these hats are a little bit disparate. They're a little bit separated. There's not a whole lot going on. So let's bring in the drums and instead of using compression right here, let's actually copy over this saturation just to have a listen to what this sounds like on the drums themselves. So I'll go back and loop a longer section here. So now we have that same saturation, that same Saturn II with the same settings acting on the drums. If we listen to the drums, which have a lot more low end, a lot more mid range and the high end, we can hear how this can help tie in a few of the drum and percussion elements within the mix. So let's have a quick listen to what this sounds like. And off. So the kick is really in your face. It almost sounds a little uncanny, a little too forward. It's a lot louder than the snare drum. Not a lot louder, but louder. Now back on. It almost pushes the kick back while also giving it a little bit more character. Definitely allows that snare to pop a little bit and helps to tie in the cymbals that are happening. Off. And we're having a similar situation here where, yes, it's taking away some of the separation between the elements, some of the space between, but that is the game that we have to play ultimately when we are talking about getting glue within the mix. So I'll turn this back on. So it's very similar to compression and compression can actually act to distort our signals and give a little bit of saturation as well. Some compressors are used for their sonic character and a lot of that character actually has to do with the inherent saturation or distortion that is present in them. And so much like bus compression, bus saturation can be used to help glue things together. If I was to turn this compressor back on in the drum bus and go add in a bit of saturation to the mix bus, we can have a listen here as well. So let's use the same Saturn II and I'll put a rather subtle, maybe 20% drive just on the warm tape, the stock settings here in the Saturn II and have a listen to what that sounds like on the entirety of the mix when I turn it on and off. Saturation is something that I sometimes use in mastering and I sometimes use it on my mix bus. I didn't end up using it in this case, but I just want you to know that if I want to glue things together, if there's a little bit too much separation going on, then this is something that I will often reach for, again, in mixing and in mastering to help to glue things together and ultimately to get a bit more loudness in many cases. So let's have a listen to this on. I'll toggle it off and then on and off. And I'll try to describe what's happening while also allowing you to hear it so I won't be talking too much. <laughs> Off. It's very subtle. Can turn this up a bit. The bass almost becomes more present. Helps to fill out that mid range, that low mids, especially. And there's a little bit of volume gain there, so not great for AB. Off. Awesome. 
So it certainly helps to tie together that little bit of harmonic generation, especially in the low mids and the mid range, help to bring out a little bit of extra flavor and cohesion within the individual tracks of the mix. I find saturations a very useful tool for bringing out a little bit more presence in our bass elements, not only bass guitar and bass synth, but also kick drum and oftentimes the snare. So when we are using it on the mix bus like this, it can really bring out those elements while also subduing them a little bit because again, we are distorting that part of the waveform and therefore having a sort of compressive effect on those frequencies of the waveform. Of course, we can drive things too far as we can with most processes. So if I was to drive this all the way up, we can hear how quickly the mix can fall apart if we tend to use saturation on our buses, particularly the mix bus in this case. So it's just completely destroyed at this point. But we can get pretty aggressive with this to help glue things together once again. But I digress. It's similar but not the same as compression, which is why I wanted to mention it separately as strategy number three for getting glue within our mixes. If you're finding these strategies useful thus far, I would encourage you to hit the like button and let me know in the comments down below. It really helps out small channels like this gain a little bit of traction here on YouTube, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to strategy number four for obtaining glue within the mix. Let's talk about utilizing common effects returns, notably on our time-based effects, delay and reverb. So if we look here, we have a plate reverb right here. I believe that's just for the snare. And then we have a delay right here, just a stereo delay. We have a mono delay, a quarter note delay. And then we have some more reverbs right here, more delay, more reverb. And so much like bussing tracks together and processing them together with bus compression, bus saturation, or other effects, we can send multiple tracks to the same effects return, affect those tracks with the same effect, notably reverb or delay. And that way we can effectively send each of those tracks to a time-based effect to give them a sense of being in the same sonic space within the mix. So delays and reverbs especially are used in mixing to give a sense of width, depth, and overall dimensionality to the mix. And so the theory behind this is if we can send multiple tracks to a single reverb and then process them all the same, we can effectively send them to the same dimension producing effect and have them sound as if they are in the same sonic space within the mix. So I hope that I made that clear. We can see here that I have two delays in this mix. It's a rather dense mix. And so in denser mixes, I like to focus or rely more on delays than I do reverbs to give a sense of space. I like reverbs for their dimensionality, yes, but they can sometimes drown out elements within the mix when there's a lot of stuff going on. I find that there is a lot of stuff going on in this mix. And so again, I relied more so on delays. If I open up this effect return delay right here, we have a stereo delay with a little bit of a difference right here. There's some band passing going on. It's a stereo delay, just the stock one from Logic. The left delay has a time of 180 milliseconds and the right one has 220. So that is being fed by bus 13. And then bus 14, we have a delay brigade from Arturia. This is based off of the Electro Harmonics Memory Man. This is an analog style delay and that is being fed by bus 14. So this is a mono delay. And the first one, of course, is a stereo delay. Now, if we go over to the rest of the tracks, we can see that we have multiple tracks being fed to 13. So let's make this mixer bigger for a second. We have hats two, hats three. Those are the samples being fed to the perks. These are being fed to the stereo delay. I also have guitar disto three. I also have synth two. And I have flute arps as well as the deduk being sent to bus 13. I hope I'm pronouncing deduk correctly, but all of these are being sent to this same delay right here. And then in terms of what's being sent to this mono analog delay, I have the flute arps once again, synth two once again, guitar disto three once again, as well as 
electric guitar one and two. These are clean guitars and the snare drum right here. And so if we listen to the track as a whole with these effects returns turned on and off, we can hear the difference between not only having and not having delay within the mix, but also having two distinct delays that are being fed by multiple tracks within the mix. So it will be subtle. Perhaps I'll mess about with the levels of these two return tracks right here just to make things more obvious, but let's have a listen back. So that's a little more obvious here. And without them. With them. Without. So not only does it make the overall mix more dry and perhaps a bit more forward when we don't have these delays on, it effectively reduces the perceived depth of the mix along with the perceived width of the mix, but it also makes many of the tracks almost sound more separate from each other. And so that is one way, once again, to help glue things together is to send them to a common delay or a common reverb within the mix. So I don't actually have reverbs to show you in this mix in particular. I do have a plate reverb for the snare as well as opposite side reverb for the guitars, but I don't happen to be using reverb in the case of this mix to help glue things together because it's a bit dense once again. And so I didn't want to wash things out within the mix. So that is strategy number four and strategy number five I have for you to help glue your mixes together is to take advantage of frequency masking. Now frequency masking, I have a video dedicated to it. I will leave a link to that in the description box down below. But basically what it is, is when two or more tracks compete for the same frequency bands and effectively mask each other, hence the name. So what this means is that because these multiple tracks are fighting for these particular frequency bands, the mix as a whole becomes unclear in those frequency bands and the individual tracks that are masking each other become ill-defined within the mix. So it can be tempting in an effort to reduce the frequency masking and to gain separation within the mix to really carve out different frequencies within the mix for individual elements in order to gain maximum separation. But as I've alluded to throughout this training, we kind of have a dichotomy between gluing a mix together and having maximum separation. And so we have to ride that pendulum, so to speak, between having a glued mix and a mix with a lot of clarity and separation. So we want to often be somewhere in the middle. And one way to help to glue things together and have a cohesive mix is to not go overboard trying to get rid of frequency masking and to actually use it in some instances to our advantage. Of course, we do want clarity within our mixes and we want to address the frequency bands that have too much clutter, too much muddiness, too much harshness, but we also want the frequencies within our tracks to interact with each other and to make great mixes and great music. Ultimately, sound sources and musical instruments will have overlap and it's important to take advantage of this overlap and the little bit of frequency masking or even a lot of frequency masking that happens as a result of this to help, again, get a nice glued together and cohesive mix. So there's not a whole lot of hard evidence I can show you within this mixing session to state that I allowed more frequency masking or less frequency masking. It mostly comes down to EQ, which is our primary tool for reducing frequency masking and just not going overboard with our EQ moves. We don't need these massive notches in certain instruments to make room for others. We can often get away with more subtle moves. The only exception I have for this generalization is the high pass filters where we'll often want to get rid of a lot of low end information in tracks that don't necessarily need that low information for the overall musicality of the mix. But other than that, we don't want to make drastic EQ moves in most cases. Of course, I can only generalize here. But my main point here is to encourage you not to go overboard to try to reduce frequency masking and maximize separation if you want a mix that is nice and cohesive and glued together. 
So that is tip number five for getting nice glued together mixes. And the key takeaway that I want you guys to have from this video is processing multiple tracks together. That is the best way to get a sense of glue within the mix after balancing and in terms of actually processing the mix. So if we can get our tracks bust together in our subgroups and processing multiple tracks together in our subgroups, we can help to tie those together. It doesn't necessarily have to be compression or saturation, although those are two of my favorite processes for helping to tie and glue things together. And we can also send multiple tracks to a common effects return and then process that effects return, not only with delay and reverb, although those are two of my favorites, but with any process that can help to tie things together by giving common processing. So again, the key takeaway here is common processing or bus processing to help tie things together and achieve more glue in our mixes. So that's what I have for you here inside of Logic Pro. All right, I hope these five strategies for helping to glue our mixes together have proved valuable and insightful for you. Please feel free to return to this video anytime in the future if you'd like a refresher on any of these techniques. And if you would like to learn more about mixing, I do have a free mixing guidebook. It will be the first link in the description box down below. You can sign up to my newsletter and I will send that to you right away. And if you'd like to hang out with me more here on YouTube, I will add another few videos in the top left and right corner. And I would also invite you to subscribe to the channel. It really helps small channels like this one get recognized in the YouTube algorithm and I would greatly appreciate it. So thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for doing all of that and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.